seven of unseen and eternal. Now in scripture, seven is the number of completion. So it just felt like a good time to land the plane. This will be our final sermon in this series. We've covered a lot of ground so far, but we've talked about everything from spiritual warfare to Jesus's return to what happens when we die. And today I wanna answer a very simple question. If all of it is true, then what do we do? Like if all of this unseen and eternal stuff is actually real, then how should we operate? How should we navigate? How should we maneuver through the world? And so one last time, 2 Corinthians chapter four, Paul writes this. So we fix our eyes, not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. Since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. So Father, would you help us understand Lord, would you be here with us now as we dive into your word? In Jesus' name, we pray. And everybody said, amen. You may take a seat. All right, help me out. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever should believe in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. If you are new to church, that's John 3, 16. You've probably heard it or heard of it or maybe seen it on a sign at a football game. It is a foundational verse for us, a reminder that we were never going to be good enough to save ourselves, but God in his love sent his son for us. Second Corinthians says that he took him who knew no sin to become sin, that we may become the righteousness of of Christ. It's the gospel message and it's good news. Now today, I, I want to think about a slightly different angle of John 3, 16. I, I want to take a moment and think about the fact that it also says that the Son stepped out of heaven to be with us. That for 33 years, Jesus walked around teaching us how to be human. It's kind of crazy when you really think about it. Quick survey of those 33 years, from zero to 30, we get very little information. We get the birth story, shepherds, wise men, we reflect on it every December. And then we get one story in Luke's gospel about when Jesus was 12 years old, and then it just says, then he continued to grow. But from 30 to 33, we get a whole bunch of amazing stories about who Jesus is. Like Jesus one day saw a bunch of uneducated, ordinary fishermen. And was like, hey, why don't you all come with me? Let's, let's do this together. Let's be best friends. Uh, but, but then they're walking down the street, and a man with leprosy, who would be unclean and untouchable, approaches them, and Jesus touches him and heals him. And then, like, in the next scene, this tax collector named Matthew, who, who would have been hated and ignored by everybody, Jesus walks right up to him and says, hey, I see you. I'm with you. Uh, let's sit down for a meal. In fact, he invites himself over to Matthew's house. Let's have dinner together. <laughs> and then uh, a synagogue leader's daughter passes away, and Jesus goes and brings her back from the dead. And while he's on the way, he heals another woman who's been struggling for 12 years. And, and on and on and on we could go. If I had to pick two words to describe Jesus' ministry, I would pick natural and supernatural. Natural in that everybody seemed to feel comfortable around Jesus. Supernatural, because then Jesus would bring heaven to earth, and he would do all of these amazing miracles, and then he'd go like right back to being natural. Jesus was both natural and supernatural. He was naturally supernatural. We as Christians oftentimes are not. Like, we are called to be weird. You realize that? Like there's a way that the world works and Jesus calls us to stand out. Like the world has a way that they approach finances and we're called to be weird. The world has a way it approaches sex and dating and relationships and we're called to look different. The world hates their enemy and hates those who persecute them. Jesus tells us to love our enemy and pray for those who persecute you. We're supposed to look weird. We're supposed to look different. And yet in all the ways we're, we're called to be weird, we are so good at being normal. We are so good at just fitting in with the rest of the world. 
But then there's times where we're called to be normal. Like Paul, we're going to talk about a passage in 1 Corinthians 9 where he says, I've learned to become all things to all people that I may preach the gospel to them. Like there are times we're called to be normal and in those moments <laughs> we panic and we start using a bunch of phrases that don't make any sense and we just end up sounding weird. So it's like when we're supposed to be weird, we're normal. When we're supposed to be normal, we're weird. So I want to preach this a very practical message today called Naturally Supernatural. How can we learn to operate and maneuver more like Jesus? What does it look like to be both natural and supernatural? Now, it's not my idea. This is straight from Jesus. Let's go to John chapter 17. This is uh, Jesus the night that he was betrayed. So he's with his disciples, giving them a, a, a final pep talk. And in John 17, he begins to pray for his disciples, which is a very humbling thing if you think about it, because that means Jesus is praying for us. Here's Jesus' prayer, John 17. My prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. Let's pause there for a second. We have an enemy. Earlier in John 10, it says the enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy, uh, which is why, like Peter writes in 1 Peter 2, we shouldn't be surprised when we face trials as if something strange were happening to us. I love what Jesus says here because he, he doesn't say, you know what, since there's an evil one, let's just get out of here. Instead, Jesus goes, no, I, wanna, I want them to be in the world. I'm sending them right into the middle of the world because the world is the arena. The world is the battleground. Jesus goes, send them in and protect them while they're there. Like, uh, imagine a coach giving a pump-up talk before a game. Like, we got to get out there, and, and, and we got to go win. And then one of the players raising his hand and being like, hey, coach, you don't think, like, the other team's going to try to stop us, do you? And the coach being like, oh, I didn't think about that. Hmm. Yeah, they may try to stop us. Maybe we should just get back on the bus and get out of here, right? Like, No. Jesus is going, of course there's an evil one who's going to try to stop you. I'm sending you into the world. And then he continues to pray in verse 16. He says this, they are not of the world, even as I am not of it. Now, the prepositions in this verse are very important. Not of the world, even as I am not of it. Verse 17, sanctify them by the truth. So he doubles down on what that truth is. Your word is truth. And finally, verse 18 this is Jesus praying for us. As you sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. So Jesus is saying to the Father, you sent me into the world. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. He sent his son. And, and Jesus is going, as you sent me into the world, I am sending you into the world. Which means that our job is to realize that we are in the world. We have been sent into the world. And at the exact same time, realize we're supposed to be not of the world. In the world, not of the world. On the Afterthoughts podcast this past week, we got to sit down with our friend Carson, who is heading to Paris uh, in a couple of weeks to swim in the Olympics. And uh, he was at an earlier service, so proud of him, so excited for him. Carson's about to go into Paris. But that doesn't mean he's swimming for France. You understand? He's going to be in France, but not of France. He's in France representing the United States. So God, is, Jesus is saying, I'm sending you into the world, but that doesn't mean that you represent team world. I'm sending you into the world to represent heaven. And so we're meant to be in the world, but not of the world. But let's be real, it's not easy. So how do we do it? The most helpful phrase for me has been be naturally supernatural. Naturally supernatural. I'll explain it with a balloon. Now, parents, you know this. Few things are more exciting to a kid than a helium balloon on a screen. It's a beautiful, beautiful thing. Like you could have your, your kid at the zoo and take them to see the cheetah, the fastest land animal, zero to 60 in under three seconds. And they'll go, that's cool. And then they'll turn around and be like, that guy has a balloon on a string? Like, Dad, you see why I need this, right? Like, we love this concept. It's very simple. Balloon, string. String, balloon. Now, without the string, the balloon would be up in the rafters. 
Without the balloon, the string would be on the ground, but together, a balloon and a string create something significant. Now, super simple illustration. You watch, though, when you go read the Gospels this week. I think this is such a beautiful picture of how Jesus operated. That Jesus, if the string represents being natural, and the, the balloon represents being supernatural, that everywhere Jesus went, he was both balloon and string. String and balloon. So John 2, Jesus gets invited to a wedding, because he's normal, gets invited to a wedding. People want him there. He shows up. He hangs out. But then what happens when they run out of wine? He does something supernatural. He does a miracle. One day he goes to Mary and Martha's house for dinner and just hangs out. It's a very natural thing to do. Another time he shows up to Mary and Martha's house because their brother Lazarus has died, and he resurrects Lazarus from the dead. That's a very supernatural thing to do. And I'll add, before he heals Lazarus, he sits down with the family and he cries. It's a very natural thing to do. Jesus was a master at, at understanding that it's both being natural and supernatural. Jesus was so good at this. If I'm being honest, I'm not always great at it. There have been lots of times where I'm just all balloon, <laughs> no string. About 11 years ago, I um, was leading a, a team of about eight to this uh, shelter in Long Beach, California that uh, takes people off the street, helps them get back up on their feet, and they do a chapel every night from 7 to 7.30. So we're up for one of them, so I, I bring my team, and we sit down with the chaplain, and he says, hey, thanks for being here. So the most important thing is we're trying to teach them routine, trying to help them stick to a schedule, and so you start at 7, make sure you're done by 7.30. So I say, no problem, I got it. And then I stand up, the team plays some music, and I get up and I start preaching. And I'm like 23 at, at the time, and young 23-year-old Ryan is going, oh, we need some more balloon in this place, you know? So I start doing that, that thing that we do where I'm like moving way faster across the stage and talking way louder, and 7.32 rolls around, and I go, I just feel like God's not quite done in this place. So we're going to get the team back up here to play some more music, and the prayer team's going to be up front. I want you to come to the altar. Come bring everything that you are carrying to the altar. We're going to pray, and God's going to break some chains. That's what we're going to do. Then I just hear from the front row the chaplain go, no, we're not. <laughs> and I look down, and he goes, it's 732. And I realize in a very humbling way, read humiliating way, those two things go hand in hand. Sometimes it's good. For a little humiliation, it's, good. it's a humbling process. Oh, I was trying to be too much balloon when actually what they need is string. What, what they need right now is routine and, and schedule. And it was actually my, my insecurity putting too much pressure on this moment, feeling like I have to make something happen. There are times where, where we're all balloon with no string. Maybe you know how that feels. Like maybe you've had some supernatural experiences with God. Uh, maybe you've, you've had an encounter with the Holy Spirit. Maybe you've heard from God. That's such a beautiful thing. I want that for you. My question is, how are you now doing operating in the natural world? Because sometimes what starts to happen is we become like that person sitting at the breakfast table with staring at our lucky charms and our fruit loops. Just going, okay, Lord, your servant is listening. Speak. Which one is it going to be this morning? I will not move till you tell me to move. The reality is, like, just pick. You're fine. You know, like, you have agency. And if we want to get deeper, God's probably saying neither because those are just sugar and stop eating sugar for breakfast. Whole different sermon for uh, another day. We have to realize that we have agency here. Like Genesis 2, God puts the man in the garden and says, work it, keep it. He doesn't tell him 20 steps of how to do that. He, he says, you know how to do this? Take the world somewhere. Be smart about it. Here's some parameters. Now go create. And, and oftentimes when we get too, too much like a balloon with, with no string, it actually paralyzes us. It, it keeps us from moving forward. Now, if you've ever had a pastoral meeting with me, you've probably heard me use this phrase, naturally supernatural. And I do that on purpose because I think it's a great framework as I'm talking through life with, with people, realizing that... that um, People oftentimes are a string on the ground and they need some balloon or they're a balloon up in the air and they need some string. Here's how I identify if they're a balloon in need of some string. They just start using a whole lot of really big 
Christian-y words that talk about what God's about to do sometime in the future. And so it's like, I just feel like God's going to move. There's just, I'm waiting right now, man, but there's this movement of God coming. Revival's coming. Revival, honestly, like, I feel like revival's not even a big enough word to describe what God is about to do. Do you know what I mean? To which I say, no. No, I don't. And I do. I just speak your language enough to, to know what you're trying to say. What I try to help people realize is, is that it may be that you're using a lot of over-spiritualized words to justify your inaction. Or in other words, sometimes we start talking too much about what God is going to do in the future as a convenient excuse to not love our neighbor today. And, and to not serve today. And to not be present today. Something happens when it's all balloon with, with no string. It's so easy to lose ourselves along the way. Sometimes the best thing that we can do is add some string to the balloon. But then if we're being honest, maybe some of you resonate more with the string on the ground. And you go, I, I love coming to Red Rocks. Like, I love the practical things that they teach. I think that can, that can help me in work and stuff. But I'm not really here for the spiritual stuff. Uh, like, I'll, I'll show up for, for the sermon, but then I'm, I'm going to get out of there because, like, you know, that, that stuff's just really not for me. Thomas Jefferson famously cut out all of the miracle stories that Jesus did out of his Bible because he was saying, I, I think he's a good teacher. Really what he's saying is I'm not ready for him to be my Lord and Savior. But, but he's saying I'm not, I'm not ready for the, the spiritual stuff. And what I want to say is, hey, uh, the spiritual stuff is in there for a reason. That's like cutting all the sound of music, all, all the music out of the sound of music. It doesn't work. Uh, like the spiritual stuff matters. It's not just us learning how to be more normal. It's us also learning how to be weird. Both of these things, naturally supernatural. Sometimes some of you need some more balloon in your life. Some of you need some more string in, in your life. And so just for a couple of minutes, I want to get really practical and, and help you wherever you, you find yourself help you add those things to, to your life. Let's start with those who need to add a little more balloon to their lives. Because see, here's the thing. Solomon is known as, as one of the wisest to ever live. And in Ecclesiastes 3, he has the, this great chapter where he says things like, there's a time for everything. A time to refrain and a time to embrace. A time to mourn and a time to dance. I was thinking about it this week, and, and I thought, you know, I'm going to use that framework. So this isn't Bible, but I'm, I'm going to use that framework and, and, and give us something to think about. I think that there is a time for everything, a time to be normal and a time to be weird. There is a time for everything, a time to be normal and a time to be weird. So let's start with the time to be weird. Paul writes in Philippians 3, verse 20, he says this, but we are citizens of heaven. We can just stop there. We are citizens of heaven. Do you know that? Where the Lord Jesus Christ lives, and we are eagerly waiting for him to return as our Savior, like Ethan talked about a couple weeks back. We are citizens of heaven. So we're in this world, but we're not of this world. If our citizenship is in heaven, then we should think different than the world. So the world has a way that they handle their money, and they call it normal. And it sounds something like this. Validation from your peers is everything. The best way to get that validation is to buy a whole bunch of stuff to impress them. What does Dave Ramsey say? We end up buying a bunch of things we don't need with money we don't have to impress people we don't even like. <laughs> hey, if that's normal, then I say no thank you. I'd rather be weird. Uh, I, I would rather realize that all the validation I need comes from God, comes from the Father, who, who in Romans 8 says, that's my son, or, or, or I'm sorry, you have been adopted as sons and daughters, and so God looks at us, and he says, you are children, you're my children, all the validation I need is right there, and now all of a sudden, I'm freed up to use my finances to play offense, to do kingdom work, to make heaven more crowded, to plant more churches. To, to feed people who are hungry, to give clean drinking water to people who need it. 
I don't need to use my, my finances to try to earn validation for people I don't even know. I'm freed up to use it for the kingdom. There's a way that is normal that seems right to the world, and I say, no, thank you. I'd rather be weird. You think about sex, dating, way of the world, hookup culture, follow your heart. It's really more like follow your hormones. Don't worry about the, all the fallout that, that comes from it. And then the world, here's the way of, of Scripture where the Bible actually has a very high view of sex as the gift that God created for the context of marriage. The world goes, oh, that's so outdated. That's so legalistic. That's just purity culture. Here's another name for it, the way of Jesus. And so if that's normal to the world, I say, no, thank you. I'd rather be weird. I'd rather think higher uh, about the, these, this beautiful gift that God has given us. What about connecting with one another? The world has a way to do it that they call normal. It, it, it's scroll on a screen for a couple hours a day and like a few pictures and send a few text messages and then complain about how your friends are falling away. That's normal. And here's, spoiler, it's not working. That's why more and more people are getting, becoming more and more isolated. That's why there is an epidemic of loneliness. It's not working. And if that's normal, I choose to say, no, thank you. Uh, I'm, I'm going to be weird. I'm going to be weird like Jesus who made it a priority to, to build a team around him and, and, and live life with that team. And, and, and realizing he could probably move a lot faster alone, but they could go further together and, and being really intentional about being with those people and saying no to some good things so that you can say yes to some great things, which is cultivating some deep friendships that can be on the surface when, you need to be, when they need to be on the surface, and they can dive into the depths and cry together when they need to, to do that. The world has a way for community that's not working, and so I say no thank you, I'd rather be weird. Some of you need to get some more balloon back into your life. I love how John writes this. In 1 John 2, he writes this. Do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, love for the Father is not in them. For everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life comes not from the Father, but from the world. The world and its desires pass away. But whoever does the will of God lives forever. John wants us to be in the world, but not be of the world. And realize that the things that the world calls normal, we actually have the option to say, actually, no, thank you. I'd rather be weird. Now, it, if you're like, man, I, I resonate with that, but I'm, I am this. What do I do? Really practically, worship. Now, some of you just said, well, duh. It's like, well, yeah, but that comes naturally to, to you. But we'll talk more about that in a second. I'm talking to the people who, who worship doesn't come naturally to. The, the ones who, who show up and go, yeah, I'll hear the sermon, but then, I, you know, I got to get out of here. Worshiping is one of the best things you can do for your soul. It's actually what you were created to do. Worshiping is the act of putting God back on the throne of your heart. Singing is just one of the ways that we practice it. But we aren't always great at it. I was at the Austin FC game a couple of months ago. My friend Brandon invited me, and the game was on a Saturday. And I show up, and man, the arena is just electric. It's so fun. I'm looking around, and there's like grown men like painting their face and shouting the entire time. And then I get in my car, and I drive here for our, our Saturday services, and I walk in the auditorium, and everyone's like, what a beautiful name it is. Nothing can stand against. I felt like righteously angry about it. It's like, so we will paint our face and shout for a team that we're not even on, but, but we won't sing to the king of kings who laid down his life for us? Like, worship matters. It's so important. It's one of the best ways to get some balloon back into your life. Now, for those who are like, yeah, but I still feel uncomfortable about it. Let me tell you what, what freed me up a long time ago. I read Psalm 95.1. Psalm 95.1 says this. Oh, come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Do you know why I sing? 
it's not because I think I'm adding to the overall quality of the sound in the room. I know that I'm not. I'm an awful singer. Anybody over there knows that I'm not. I sing because God tells me to sing. It's obedience. And if it's weird for you, maybe today you just practice it as obedience. You practice it as a way of saying, yes, sir. God, you, you call me to sing. Okay, I'll sing. Raising your hands. Another great example it can be an uncomfortable experience, but Psalm 134 says this. Lift up your hands in the sanctuary and praise the Lord. See it as an invitation into obedience. Where you go, I feel kind of weird about this, but maybe I need to be a little more weird in my life. And so I'm going to try this. Because our posture helps. Sometimes it helps our mind catch up with what our soul has been longing for all week long. We sing and we worship as an act of obedience. And let me just add this, last thing I'll say about worship, is your emotions matter. They really do. It's a beautiful part of it, but they're not everything. And so your emotions belong in the car, but don't let them drive. In other words, don't see worship as a, as a, a, a motive experience where you are, are chasing some sort of a feeling. See it as what it is, worship of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords and your uh, 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 conscious decision to put God back up on the throne. I'll say it like this. This week, I worshiped angry. So something happened, story for another day. Short version is God's timeline is moving a lot slower than my ideal timeline. Not sure if anyone can ever resonate with that. Reached a boiling point, and I got frustrated. And so I came down into this room. Nobody was here. Put my headphones on. Turned on Holy Forever, and I worshiped angry. Now, didn't change my mood. There was no breakthrough, no magical transformation happened, but it was an act of obedience. That was my way of saying, hey, I'm not crazy about what's happening right now, but God, you're still in control. I don't love how this chapter is being written currently, but you are the author. Angry worship, I think, is pure. I think it's beautiful. Let that deconstruct some of the religion that, that you have in you. Like, if you were to go meet the royal family, you would take a shower, and you would get a haircut, and you would be on your best behavior. Jesus isn't just the king. He's the king of kings. And when he was here, he had a knack for finding the people who were far from God and sitting down with the ones who were frustrated, sitting down with, with the least of these, sitting down with the ones who were angry, and saying, bring it all with you. I, I can handle it all. Just be here with me now. This is the God we serve. He's big enough for your emotions. And so no matter how you feel today, there's something beautiful uh, about just ascribing ultimate value to God through worship. It is one of the most practical ways to add some more balloon into your life. But now let's talk about the, the, the ones who go, yeah, I think string is really more <laughs> what, what I need th this week. Let me first encourage you. Um, Paul was one of the most supernatural humans to ever live, second really only to Jesus from what I, I, from my studies. Like, there's a story in Acts 19 about Paul's handkerchief being passed around, and it was still healing people. Paul was operating in the supernatural. Oh, but he also understood how to be normal, and it can be both. He, he writes this in 1 Corinthians 9. He, he writes to, to the church in Corinth, though I am free and belong to no one, I have made myself a slave to everyone. Why? To win as many people as possible. To the Jews, I became like a Jew to win the Jews. To those under the law, I became like one under the law, though I myself am not under the law, so as to win those not under the law. Verse 21 says, to those not having the law, I became like one not having the law, though I am not free from God's law, but am under Christ's law, so as to win those not having the law. Now, at this point, you're like, Paul, what are you talking about? 22. The important verse, to the weak I have become weak, to win the weak. I have become all things to all people, so that by all possible means, I might save some. It's a mission statement for Paul's life. He's going, I will become whoever I need to become, if that means it'll help me preach the gospel to them, to help make heaven more crowded. 
So, so Paul understood that string is a necessary part of the process. That, that it's not just a call to be supernatural, it's a call to be naturally supernatural. One of the, the symptoms for me personally, when I realize I'm all balloon and I need some string back in my life, one of the symptoms is I am greatly affected by the room that I walk into and by people's moves in the room that I walk into. I'm a feeler. I prefer the biblical word discernment. It, if that's you and you resonate with that, it's an amazing gift that God gives us. It's also one that we have to work to cultivate because it means we can also be really affected by the moods of other people. And when I'm just a string up in the rafters with no grounding, well, well then I need everyone to be okay with me. Uh, I need everyone to be in a good mood. And I need like everything to be just perfect. And then I can have like, uh, I, can, I can meet with God. Which if we're just being real, in a fallen world, that happens like a couple of minutes a month. <laughs> Most of the time, there's conflict. Most of the time, like, everyone's not okay. And, and when you're just a balloon up in the rafters, you are greatly impacted by the moods of other people. So, like, parents, you, you, you walk down the stairs ready for it to be a great day, but then one kid's yelling at the other. Your spouse is already mad at you about something. Before you know it, you're, you're spiraling. Yes, you need, you need some string to, to put onto to the balloon. Like, here's one, Romans 8.1. There, therefore, is now no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. Well, when I'm just a, a balloon floating around and then I have a bad day, I spiral. I, I need to remind myself who God is and who God says I am. Are you with me? But we have to understand who God calls us to be. And when we do that, we'll stop being so greatly impacted by the world and all the people uh, around us. It's like in church, it almost creates this like spiritual codependency. Where, where it's like, well, I, I'm going to show up, and as long as they're singing all the songs I like in the right order, as long as it's not too cold in the auditorium, but also not too hot, and as long as my favorite communicator is up there preaching, oh, no, it's Ryan, you know? <laughs> like, we need all the conditions to be perfect, and then maybe we can have this spiritual I experience. It's like a balloon up in the rafters. Hey, there are people in this auditorium right now strategically placed who are just interceding and praying for you. You know why? Because they understand that they are called to be naturally supernatural. And so they woke up early this morning and they spent time with, with God. They got into to the word and, and they were reminded who they are. And now they show up to Red Rocks ready to play some offense. Not needing everything to be perfect before they do. Ready to say, hey, how can I help make heaven more crowded today? That's a picture of string and balloon, balloon and string. And when you can learn to have both, two things happen. You stop being so affected by other people and by your surroundings. And two, you become so much more effective for the kingdom of heaven. It's like uh, uh, working out. Um, Ethan and Doug come over sometimes to, uh, to talk through like our next sermon series. And it's fun when they're over because we, we spend a few minutes talking about the series and then we usually end up in my garage working out because we just think better, you know, when we're being active. And uh, it's nice having them there because, uh, like, when I'm by myself in the garage, I'm not going to lift as heavy. Like, the worst feeling in the world is when you're bench pressing and you realize that you can no longer bench press it, but you don't have anyone around you to spot you. So when, when Ethan's there, Doug's there, they can spot me and I can go, I can, I can push myself. But now if I'm at the end of bench pressing and I got nothing left and Ethan's there as my spot, his job is to, to help lift it a, a little bit more so that I can get one more rep in. But imagine if I was like, hey, E, let's keep going. And I, even though I have nothing left, I'm making him continue to spot me. Like at some point, it's no longer me bench pressing. It's just Ethan doing like shoulder shrugs, <laughs> right? Okay, listen, church. We are called to spot one another, but we aren't called to work out for one another. So Paul in Galatians 6.2 says, bear each other's burdens. But then Jesus calls us to pick up our own cross. This phrase has been on my, my heart all week. Bear each other's burdens. But don't carry each other's crosses. Be there for them. Encourage them. 
be in their corner always, help them out, whatever they need. But at the end of the day, they have to go pick up their own cross for themselves. One, because if we keep trying to pick up their cross, we're going to enable them to continue to make bad decisions. Two, and most importantly, because the whole point of us learning to pick up our own cross is to eventually realize that we can't. And then when we realize that we can't, it's this beautiful moment of surrender where we're reminded that there's somebody who did, and his name is Jesus. He's the one that picked up his cross. He's the one that carried his cross all the way to Calvary. He's the one who laid down his life that we may go free. He is the hero of the story. And I worry that sometimes we're trying to say, yeah, but also me though, right? Like I can be the hero in your story. I can help out. It's like there's one hero in the story. It's not Ryan. His name's Jesus. And so bear each other's burdens, spot one another, absolutely. But at the end of the day, you can't save other people. Your job is to point them to Jesus. And when, when we're just a, a balloon up in the rafters and we don't have that firm foundation, that grounding, I worry sometimes for me and for others that we just get tossed around by the other people's stuff all the time. And it's like, hey, we can actually learn how to be naturally supernatural, how to have a firm enough foundation in who we are that we can be there for other people without trying to save other people. So this idea became really tangible to me Easter weekend a couple of years ago. Um, I had a, it was Friday, so Good Friday, getting ready to, to come preach the Good Friday message. And that Friday morning, I had a really um, uncomfortable encounter with somebody. It felt very dark. It felt demonic, and it affected me way more than I wish it had affected me. It was causing me to, to second guess, causing me to spiral, it was causing me to feel really insecure about the message and about everything. I was just thrown off. I was like a balloon up in the rafters. So I pick up Doug, and we're driving to the church, and I'm telling him all about it, and he's helping me. He's bearing that burden with me. And then we get up to the grass lot, and he starts praying for me before we, we come in here. And I will never forget the prayer that, that he prayed. At the very end of it, here's what he said. He said, may the heaven within you be unaffected by the world around you. And then he said, and may the world around you be dangerously impacted by the heaven within you. And it was a mind shift for me. I think some of you need to make today. Realizing that my body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit is with me. Meaning I can walk into a room and I'm not subject to everybody else's feelings around me. Like Doug gave a, a two-part series on the armor of God. It's a huge piece of it. It's learning how to arm yourself with, with the sword of the Spirit and the shield of faith and the helmet of salvation and the sandals of peace and the belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness. Why? so that we're not so impacted and influenced by the world around us, so that we can be in the world, but not of the world. And then church, when we learn how to do that, suddenly we become so much more effective for the kingdom. Suddenly you're able to, to show up and hold space for someone who's angry. And the whole time you're not worried about, oh, what is this, how's this gonna reflect on me? Instead, you're, you're seeing them as a human being going through something, asking yourself questions like, what else is going on? What else is this about? Suddenly you start to become so much more strategic and good at helping people sort through the, their own stuff to bear their burdens with them because you're not trying to carry their cross for them. Instead, you're pointing them to Jesus. You're pointing them to the one who did. It's naturally supernatural. And so we uh, thought long and hard about how to end this entire Unseen and Eternal series and then realized that the best thing to do is to do what Jesus did with his disciples on that night. It's to take communion together. So you should have grabbed uh, one of these when you came in. If you didn't, no worries, uh, just raise your hand. We got some, some ushers who are gonna come around and bring you one. Can we make some noise for all of our ushers? You guys are the best, the heroes. Just keep your hands up, we'll get there. Jesus on the night he was betrayed knew 
that, that these very imperfect disciples were about to be the ones going to plant churches all around the world. And he probably knew that they had a long way to go. And what I love is instead of giving them like 10 strategies for effective church planning, <laughs> make sure there's a parking lot with more than two exits. <laughs> Sorry. <clears throat> um, instead of doing that, he gave them a very practical, natural illustration for this supernatural thing that he was about to go do. He was giving them something tangible to hold on to, the bread and the cup, as a picture of him laying down his life. See, see, he was, what, 12 hours, 13 hours away from going to the cross. And he knew, man, he knew the disciples weren't going to fully get it. He knew that they would be running away and they would get scared. And so he was giving them a tangible reminder to come back to it. He says, come back to it as often as you can. And so what we're gonna do if you're new to this whole experience is I'm gonna read the story in just a second and we're gonna take the, the bread, which represents Jesus's body being broken for the body, being broken for us. And then we're going to, to drink the cup, which represents Jesus's blood being spilled out, being poured out. It's Jesus going, hey, tomorrow I'm gonna finish this whole thing once and for all. I'm going to, to finish this whole thing once and for all because my Father, God, so loved the world. He sent His one and only Son. Whoever would believe in Him shall not perish but have eternal life. So let's pick up the story in Matthew 26. Matthew 26, 26 says this. While they were eating, Jesus took bread, and when He had given thanks, He broke it and gave it to His disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body. Let's take that together. Verse 27 says this, then he took a cup and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them saying, drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Let's drink together. Church, there's a lot going on in our world, a lot of stuff that is seen. Would we be a church that understands for everything that we can see, there's also a, a whole spiritual battle that is unseen? And that for all the temporary things going on, there is also an eternal story being written that we are called to be a part of. And, and may we learn how to operate for, for both naturally and supernaturally just like Paul, becoming all things to all people, that we may point as many as possible to Jesus. Wherever this sermon finds you, whether you need more balloon or more string, the answer is to fix our attention on Jesus. And so would you guys stand to your feet? We're gonna sing a song called Holy Forever. This reminder that, that Jesus is, is not just holy, but is holy, 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 holy for. singing or not, whether you feel comfortable in this moment or you need some more balloon in your life, man, this is a great opportunity to, to try. And so, Father, we love you so much. We thank you that you have called us to, to not just what is seen and temporary, but to what is unseen and eternal. Father, I pray for every soul in this room, for everyone watching online, for the ladies at the Lane Murray unit, would you help us live naturally supernatural? Would you empower us to live naturally supernatural? And would you get all the glory forever and ever in Jesus' name? Let's worship.